Well, I want to thank everybody for coming out today. Uh, this is the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and the University of California, San Diego. And one thing I noticed, I'm really surprised that there are still quite a few sandwiches left out here. So on the break, I'd like everybody to report to the sandwich bench and take one more, because <laughs> otherwise the graduate students will just get them. So uh, the other bit of, of housekeeping is the restrooms are just along this corridor to the left. So, um, so given that this is a group of, of historians and oceanographers in history, um, I wanted to, to talk about three historic things that happened in a short radius from where you're sitting now. And, and maybe the most important in terms of why we're sitting here today. Hmm. Uh, where's the IT guy? Do you know what the feedback is about? Ah, probably. I know how to turn the Mac off. I don't know how to turn the PC off. Let's see. Oh. Yeah, how's that? I, I think I pushed the right. Oh, I have to put function something, right? OK. <clears throat> Maybe it's just the power of my voice. But um, So anyway, I wanted to mention uh, three historic events in the, the history of, of oceanography and, and climate that happened in a very short radius uh, from here. And, and one is the founding of what was at the time the uh, San Diego Biological uh, Association and by, by, by William Ritter, who was a biology professor at, at uh, Berkeley. And he decided on this beautiful place where we are today to build the building that you see just to the north of us here which is the, the George Scripps uh, Marine Biological Laboratory. And, and that lab is a little bit more than 100 years old at this point. It's the oldest continuously used uh, oceanographic facility in the Western Hemisphere. So, so if you get a chance, go by and, and take a look at that. But, but then on the upper floor, on the third floor of that building, Harold Sverdrup, who's the third director of Scripps, wrote the first oceanographic textbook, just called The Oceans. Probably any of you who work in oceanography know, you know, the, the Sverdrup textbook. Well, it was written during the war on the third floor of that building. And then the next building over, which looks sort of similar sort of tan building, is where uh, Charles David Keeling had his facilities to measure uh, CO2. And they're still maintained in one of the labs there. Some of the original equipment, just as a way of going back to check, you know, calibration. Do are we really seeing a signal, or is it, you know, some drift in our instrument? And so, so here with it in a pretty short radius, you know, some fairly major events have happened. And, and so, um, in that context, then it's a, it's a great place to have this kind of symposium. And I'm going to turn it over to John Alanez, who will talk about what we're going to hear today. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. This is actually the first um, public outreach event of its type for the History of Science Society, what I hope will be a long, long history of uh, bringing history of science and sharing our passion for the scholarship with people who have been very gracious hosts and wonderful uh, and a wonderful audience. So, again, thank you very much for joining. <clears throat> I want to thank. Uh, John Hildebrand, as well as SIO, for giving us a gorgeous campus to meet on. Sorry for uh, depriving you of the oceans by closing the doors, but we promise to open them up again fairly shortly. Um, also, the history of science, uh, sorry, the science studies program at UCSD for providing the shuttle. Sorry, it was running a little bit late. Um, but the shuttle will continue to run until, for about another 30 minutes, you'll already hear, but it'll continue, start up again uh, after the program is done and be able to shuttle everybody back to the, the conference hotel. Um, and also the History of Science Society for providing lunch and giving the opportunity to uh, and taking the step forward into this new type of program. So with that, we'll go ahead directly into the uh, oh my piece of paper it's gone. Uh, we'll go directly into the program. Um, so first, we're going to have be joined by Eric Conway, uh, who is the historian at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the co-author of uh, Merchants of Doubt, along with Naomi Oreskes, who many of you know here from uh, SIO. So with that, if you'd like to please come up and join us, and you'll join me in welcoming Eric Conway. Well, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm from the Jet Propulsion Lab, and I always 
caveat this by pointing out that we have absolutely nothing to do with jet engines. Never have. We were originally the Army's ballistic missile development organization, and then after uh, going into space, took on as our job pl primarily planetary exploration. But about a third of our budget now is from Earth science work, um, including being what the NASA lead center for physical oceanography. And that's what I'm going to talk to you today about. Um, now, I have this picture of uh, a fragmenting glacier up in Alaska um, is to set up myself off in talking about what natural scientists in the 19th century um, were thinking about when they were thinking about changing climates. They were just discovering the fact that the ice ages had existed. They had previously had a very fixed notion of human climate, in fact, barely thought about it at all. The climate didn't really change that one would not see the scars of climate change on the face of the world. But during the 19th century, they discovered that that was wrong and that somehow they certainly didn't understand how yet. The climate of the Earth had come to change so much that ice sheets had once covered parts of, or large parts of Northern Europe and of North America, setting the natural scientists that existed at the time off into this intellectual quest to figure out how that was possible. In 1860, for example, the Irish experimentalist John Tyndall had shown in laboratory experiments that water vapor and carbon dioxide and methane were the principal reasons the Earth was and is larger, or excuse me, warmer than it would be if it were just a bare rock floating in space. A fact that had been calculated much earlier, around 1805, but which no one understood. How was it possible? There was theorized by Jean-Jacques Fourier it had something to do with the atmosphere. Here is John Tyndall arguing that it's because of these gases and their effects on the infrared. And so others started to think, well, maybe changing levels of these gases might have something to do with the motions of the ice ages. Later in the century, and the American geologist uh, Thomas Chounder Chamberlain took that idea a bit further and conceived, this is him over here, of the idea of a carbon cycle, that somehow carbon dioxide would move through the different parts of the Earth's geosphere and biosphere in a continuing and hopefully never-ending cycle, be put back into the air by volcanoes, deposited out in the ocean's floors, forming these vast beds of calciferous sediments that we can see. Um, if, for example, if you take what I like to call the existential highway out to Vegas, you will drive through hundreds of millions of years of carboniferous sediments. Chamberlain, as an American geologist, knew about those sediments, and so he thought maybe this was one way, this cycling was a way that we could explain the progressions of the ice ages. So by 1900, it was asked, possible to ask this question, is atmospheric carbon dioxide changing? It wasn't yet possible to really answer it. You could also ask, what impact would it have if it did? And this gentleman, Svante Arrhenius, is the famous first climate modeler, the person who actually sat down and tried to calculate the effects of doubling carbon dioxide by hand, there's no computers yet, um, at each of the cardinal latitude points. Um, and he came up with an answer that's very familiar to us now, somewhere between a degree and a half and four and a half degrees Celsius globally average, we would get for a temperature increase from that increase. Now, I have to tell you, because my scientist friends would make me or they hear, that his model of how the atmosphere works was very wrong. And so he got basically the right answer, or at least we believe is basically the right answer for a lot of wrong reasons. And yet, you can also call him the father of climate modeling. This gentleman, Guy Stewart Callender, is the first person who actually managed to show that carbon dioxide was really increasing in the atmosphere. Um, he was a British steam engineer, and he published his results in 1939. Um, yet that did not set off our modern interest in climate change because there was this war that people were much more concerned with and so nobody really thought again about this work until the 1950s. Um, and this brings us to this place where you're sitting now, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, because the rediscovery of this work from the 1930s by these two gentlemen, Roger Ravel and Hans Seuss, led caused them to argue over whether it could be true that carbon dioxide is really going up in the atmosphere because the oceans have an enormous ability to absorb CO2, just enormous. So the argument between them was, 
Do the oceans absorb it so rapidly we will never see an increase from human emissions and therefore calendar's wrong? Or if we went and measured very precisely the CO2 concentration of the atmosphere and then came back 10 years later, maybe we'd see an increase. That was Ravel's argument. Um, and they, so they got funded a proposal to go out and measure the CO2 of the atmosphere, concentration of the atmosphere for the 18 months of the International Geophysical Year every four hours for the entire 18 month period, um, both in Mauna Loa, Loa, Hawaii and down in Antarctica for comparison, um, in order to establish this baseline. Now again, they didn't actually expect to see an increase, they expected to see it, to have to come back years later and try again. But of course they were wrong in their speculations, and that led us to this graph, one of the most famous environmental totems of the 20th century. It was actually increasing about a percent and a half a year. The instrumentation was so good that I could actually see it vary during each day, to recording the, uh, the diurnal cycle of carbon dioxide production and consumption by plants in the area. Later work by Seuss and others demonstrated via isotope geochemistry that the CO2 was coming from fossil fuels, closing that loop of evidence. And so by the mid-1970s, there's no longer any scientific question about the origins of this carbon dioxide. But the consequences were not quite so well understood. Yet it caused Ravel to begin thinking about consequences. Through his worldwide industrial civilization, man is unwittingly conducting a vast geophysical experiment. Within a few generations, he's burning fossil fuels that slowly accumulated in the earth over the past 500 million years. He wrote this in, a, in the appendix to a presidentially commissioned report of the, of the President's Science Advisory Committee um, that was published in 1965 called Restoring the Quality of the Environment. It's become very famous in my field and largely forgotten outside it, but this is the year I was born. So this, again, this interest in climate change and its effects are not new. Over the next 14 years, a lot of research took, so began to take place on various aspects of climate processes. Um, one focus on, became on the countervailing role that aerosols might play in counteracting or counterbalancing this greenhouse gas-induced warming that these scientists believe would happen. Um, but by 1979, scientists could make a declarative statement um, about climate. And Vern Sumi, the University of Wisconsin, very famous meteorologist, probably the greatest promoter of weather satellites of, of the time, uh, argued in the introduction to a uh, National Academy of Sciences report titled Carbon Dioxide and Climate. Carbon dioxide continues to increase. The study group finds no reason to doubt that climate changes will occur, and or rather result, and no reason to believe that they'll be negligible. Yet that very same paragraph contains an enormous caveat. The study group points out that the oceans, that great and ponderous flywheel of the global climate system, may be expected to slow the course of observable climatic change. In other words, the change in the surface temperature record. So a wait and see policy may mean waiting until it is too late. What Sui meant by this is that the oceans serve to retard by some amount the surface warming because of their enormous heat capacity. And so I've got this little animation that will play in the background without any sound um, in case uh, you want the, what I think consider to be a fun demonstration of heat capacity. Well, I talk about it um, as a matter of oceanographic interest. This, the gentleman in the blue shirt is a young oceanographer at JPL by the name of Josh Willis, who's very good at public outreach. And here he's showing you how little heat, heat the air can hold. Um, as a matter of ocean, oceanography, the oceans are vast, and so figuring out what the effective heat capacity of the oceans, as opposed to a balloon full of water, is much more challenging, because it involves the rate at which heat can be mixed down into the deep oceans. If you think about the thousands and thousands of feet of water, if heat only mixed in the first 10 meters, then the effective heat capacity of the oceans is not great. And it would not return, retard the surface temperature, the air temperature that we're all concerned about, increase by very much. If, on the other hand, the oceans mixed instantly, 
then the entire heat capacity of the oceans would be available and retard, would retard the surface warming by centuries and maybe millennia. Yeah, the balloon will blow up. The heat capacity of water. So the question for oceanographers and for people interested in the intersections of oceans and climate is, how deep and how fast will the heat mix? That's not a simple question to answer. And it inspires research programs for years. And unfortunately, they actually quit at this point, and so you don't get to see the balloon never blow up. <laughs> now, we're talking about mixing. Vertical mixing in the ocean turns out hard to be measured. Why do I have this picture of an atomic bomb blast? Because these above ground nuclear weapons tests gave, gave oceanographers, somewhat unwittingly, a great tool to begin to try to figure that out. They produced these radioisotopes that had lifetime spans in the decades, and they could be followed in their movements through the oceans if one went out and measured them. So you could determine vertical mixing in various parts of the oceans, um, by this proxy measurement, now this isn't actually heat itself, but it's something like heat that we can follow as it moves through the oceans. So by, again, by the time this 1979 National Academy report had been written, they already knew there was vertical mixing. They had some inklings of how much it would be that they also had great variability in different ocean basins, for example, which just made figuring out this ocean's role in climate that much more difficult. So they couldn't quantify this effect that they all knew had to be there. Now this radioisotope thing is a great tool, but you had to actually go out and measure it, and one of the great problems of oceanography was the problem of measurement. And this is a particular aspect of the problem, it's known as the undersampling problem in oceanography. I put this chart up here, because this is the number, this is a chart of all the measurements made on the Pacific Ocean to a depth of 10 meters over, let's see, the period of 1854 to 1971. There's a whole lot of empty, of unsampled ocean. And here's another one. This is the Atlantic Ocean Survey done for the International Geophysical Year. Well, they called it an International Geophysical Year. It lasted 18 months. But this survey actually took five years. The oceans change in five years, of course. You can't measure a current on a scale of that slow. So the oceanographers had this enormous problem. They developed a very fixed view of the oceans from their data because that's the best they could do. They knew the oceans changed on a time scale faster than they could measure it. But how can, how can you possibly take enough measurements quickly enough to be able to unpack some of these effects? Well, part of the answer came from spacecraft. This is a Nimbus, this is actually a drawing of a Nimbus weather satellite. It was an experimental series done by the Goddard Space Flight Center uh, for NASA in the 1960s and through most of the 1970s. They demonstrated the utility of a number of different kinds of sensors. For example, the use of infrared radiometers to measure sea surface temperature. Some of them, this one in particular, contained a microwave that dish, the funny looking half dish there, um, was a microwave sensor that was able to measure sea ice uh, distributions as well as uh, sea surface temperatures and, and other ocean related things. Vern Sumi, I mentioned before, was the great supporter of both this and the NOAA Weather Satellite Series development. He had developed what's known as the spin scan camera, which is still the primary measurement on the geosynchronous uh, weather satellites that we use for storm warnings. Um, NASA had no dedicated um, Earth Sciences program during the 60s and 70s. This was all part of what they called an applications program that was explicitly intended to develop applications, scientific applications for use by other federal agencies and, and hopefully the private sector. Um, this was the first dedicated oceanographic satellite the United States built that was called CSAT. The reason it's so bloody big is it's actually built on the core of an atlas, or rather an Agena upper stage. So they converted the entire second stage of the rocket into a satellite. Um, the big antenna on the bottom is a synthetic aperture radar. Uh, this was a very ambitious mission. Unfortunately for the scientists involved in it, it only actually lasted about three months. 
and a power coupling failure. Uh, the Air Force had supplied the Agena, the rock, upper rocket stage, um, along with a classified power coupling that turned out not to work so well. The CSAT mission, though, introduced oceanography, and this is another director of this institution, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, um, to a problem that would become endemic to the American Earth Sciences um, forever after. And that was that CSAT, which only lasted three months, produced amounts and kinds of data that had become available are completely foreign to the existing oceanographic community. Now, Nuremberg wrote this to try to fend off NASA's desires to immediately refly another mission like CSAT. He saw, as I interpret his, his writings to the NASA Advisory Council, he was actually chairman of the National Advisor, NASA Advisory Council at this time. Um, there are two components to his argument that scientific, oceanographic scientists were unfamiliar with these kinds of data, which is certainly true. Most of the people, the people producing this data came from physics because remote sensing instruments are largely developed by physicists. And so there's a whole different nature of what a remote sensing instrument produces by and large is a thing called a radiance value. And then you use an algorithm, a mathematical conversion formula down here on the ground to convert it into the geophysical variable that you want, a temperature or pressure or whatever. So the first problem is that oceanographers themselves either had to learn new things or we had to get new oceanographers. The second problem is the scale of the data. This satellite produced millions of measurements a month, not the hundreds of measurements that you could get, maybe th a few thousand, out of a year of oceanographic survey work. That's an infrastructural problem that had to be resolved. Somehow, computing had to be brought to the oceanographic community. It took the CSAT science team, which had no oceanographers on it, by the way, five years to produce their first map of sea surface, the altitudes of the sea surface from a baseline. Um, and this is their map of 1983, showing that the oceans had about the surface variability that oceanographers had expected. They had expected a range between zero and 40 centimeters, and you can see that, that the level of resolution the satellite could provide them, the va height variation was about 25 centimeters. So solving this undersampling problem for oceanographers and therefore getting oceanographers more interested in the things that NASA did, which was important to NASA management, required two different technological revolutions in satellites and in computing, and at least one institutional revolution. Oceanographic centers had to become computing centers, or places with computing infrastructures had to become oceanographic centers. In practice, what's happened is both. The NASA dedicated oceanographic satellite, which is a joint NASA CNES mission. Sorry, uh, those of us in the space business pronounce the French Space Agency, which is the Centre, Centre National de Tudes Spatiales CNES, because our ability to speak French is zilch. <laughs> it's not launched until 1993, partly because of Nuremberg's advocacy against doing it until NASA had really prepared the way. And for NASA, that meant reforming how the agency itself did things. NASA actually implemented, finally, and during the 1980s, an Earth Sciences program and not an Applications program. It created an oceanographic directorate at headquarters. It assigned responsibilities for various aspects of oceanography to different centers. As I said at the beginning of my talk, JPL does physical oceanography, whereas our Goddard Space Flight Center over in Maryland does primarily the biological oceanography work. Um, and it created a computing initiative, an earth sciences computing initiative, because computing is essential to understanding these large amounts of data. Um, now I've been talking to you mostly about satellite stuff, um, and if you know anything about salt water, you know it's essentially opaque to electromagnetic radiation. So our fancy expensive satellites can only measure literally the top few millimeters of the oceans. If you want to know anything else, we need some sort of buoy network. And I sold this off of a Scripps website a few days ago, back on the 5th of December. This is the Argo buoy network, another of the great technologies enabled by the microelectronics resolution. These profiling buoys that are completely automated, that are released into the oceans, 
and to provide temperatures and velocities and salinities down to 2,000 meters. And every 10 days they surface and they dump their data up to satellites that come back down to our computers in order to get assimilated into models. This is just an image of the NASA Columbia supercomputer at the Ames Research Center. This is what a computing center is starting to look like anyways. Um, this was built in part to enable the kinds of data interpretation that one needs to make an ocean make sense out of these oceans and oceans of different kinds of data sets. And some de to some degree, this computer can be an ocean in a box. It runs one particular um, ocean circulation model called ECHO, the Estimating Circulation and Climate of the Ocean model, which is a product of the J Jet Propulsion Lab, MIT, and again, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And this is what an ECHO visualization looks like. This is actually sea surface salinity um, on a particular day this past August from the Argo float system. And this is salinity at 500 meters on the same day. This is a data assimilation model. It's not a forecasting model. Its job is to put into some sense, or rather to put the data into a, a form that makes us sense to us humans so that we can interpret it. Note also all these logos that I've left on here, which I've included to suggest the different kinds of institutions that are now involved in oceanography. You see, you have MIT, you have us here at Scripps, um, you have the Jet Propulsion Lab, like I said, we mostly do planetary exploration. Um, there's a couple of foreign partners involved in this as well. So now it would be far too much for me to claim, and I'm just about out of time here. Let's see if my video will run. Oh, there we go. It's far too much for me to claim that the ocean's role as this, to quote Vern Sumi again, great and ponderous flywheel of the global climate system is fully understood and quantified. But decades of effort by a lot of people and a number of institutions have brought the oceans into a clearer focus. It's possible to replace the static image that oceanography once had with images like this. This is again that a visualization from that echo ocean state estimation model I told you about before. Whereas before I gave you a static view, it can also give you this one. Um, but this required a tremendous amount of supercomputing power to put together, and I love the vortices. The vortex structures visible in the ocean models is really tremendous. I hope you've also noticed that my story has shifted its nature. I started out telling you about individual scientists, but I'm also, at the end, I'm ending with institutions. We had a period in science in which we could rightly attribute advancement to lone individuals, but increasingly, that's becoming difficult to defend as historians of science. And what we have now is dick products like this that require many people across many institutions using a variety of technologies in order to produce this view of the ocean's role <coughs> in the climate. Um, and finally, I've told you a story that I think is also becoming better understood in our history of science one in the role of infrastructure in the modern earth sciences. That supercomputer I showed you earlier can do many things, but it can do this thing. It is supported in order to do many things. There are now a wide variety of such large-scale computers. Um, that Columbia supercomputer has been superseded, though it still exists. It is actually, believe it or not, it is actually used primarily as the visualizer for even larger scale supercomputing based module, mo mo models, if I can disentangle my tongue. Sustaining this kind of a research infrastructure is a challenge for ocean scientists, though, because American science is not structured to sustain long term data collection and measurement. We tend to call that monitoring, not science. And so NASA, the institution I work for, for example, doesn't like to do. NASA likes to build new things, not keep doing the same old things. It likes to have some other agents to do spawn and lock onto. Uh, we particularly like to try to give stuff to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, but increasingly they can't get the money for to take those kinds of things away from us um, as we would like. So our tendency is to build an instrument, use it for a few years, then build something else. And that's an evolution in American science that still has to take place.
That's the end of my talk. See, do we have time for questions? Ask away, please. Oh, sure. Yes, I think you're the only one. <laughs> um, my question was about um, the wiring of the oceans for fiber optic cables. So, what's going on off the coast of BC and Washington? Mm -hmm. They're setting up these fiber optic cable systems. And as I understand it, the idea is that uh, individual universities or private companies will then tack on their robotics and their uh, monitoring equipment to that infrastructure that's already set up. I don't actually know anything about that. That, okay. that, that sounds very interesting. Um, Helen, you, you do a little more of a background. Yeah, it's yeah, like two weeks in. Yeah, it's two weeks in for you too. It's, it's called the Ocean Observing Initiative. The infrastructure part is housed up the hill in what used to be the Scripps Library. Oh. Uh, it's an NSF, NSF um, funding? Major, major research uh, project like the Gravity, Gravitational Wave Observatory. And it's so the Part of it is putting out the, the doing exactly what you said, putting out a bunch of fiber optic cables with the option for various groups who developed sensors to show up and hook up. Because the expensive part is putting out the cable. Yeah. And, and that provides you with things that you don't get with either of these methods, which is long term continuous data from the ocean floor. And it's relatively, and it's, I assume that they also assume that NSF is expecting the, the partners to bring in funding too. Um, I think it's possibly industrial projects. Universities are, you know, you have to write a proposal that right. you're going to run this class of sensors on this network. Okay. Sure. I think the gentleman's question, though, the um, University of Victoria, um, they, in Canada, they, they started earlier. It's been about $28 million for Venus and Neptune. Those are their two programs. And then I think the NSF funded $400 million or $500 million for the U.S. side. So the answer Duncan's given is related to the University of Washington and SIA very involved in that. But it's the same kind of a concept of both sides. And when the Canadians put it in, because a lot of USB uh, subs go through there, they had to detune certain things. Uh, but, but the idea would be that RVs and autonomous underwater vehicles can dock and get recharged and unload information. So it will provides persistent long-term uh, monitoring. So infrastructure. tried doing this in some of the NASA algorithm programs. Um, we've tried to make the data, first off, the data is publicly accessible, but because it's difficult to understand, it's not widely used. And so what we one thing our outreach folks have been trying to do is, is repackage some of the data in ways that's more understandable and so that it can be used in, in, in high school level education. Um, and so well, the way I could see citizen science being done is, is, is if there's more of that, the data is put into forms and places that are more publicly accessible. Because I mean, the reality is that the oceans are so enormous, there's, and there's so much data that no one looks at most of it. Right? We, we kind of get these big picture views like I saw you, or scientists write a paper about a small bit that they found interesting and they have to see or have the reason to be looking for, but enormous amounts of data is never looked and so that's where I could see an intersection for citizen science. But I also think that there would have to be some way of, of funding that kind of uh, education, just as just as oceanographers had to be taught what re uh, remote sensing data was and how to use it and so on. You would now have to bring the members of the public interest to that kind of level, to that kind of level, or bring the data to a level that you Oh, I, now I have three. And I guess you haven't asked a question yet. Thank you. So, I really like that real-time news. Almost <laughs> mm -hmm. real-time. That was 2007. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, yeah. um, um, I think the oceans is, some, is a system that is slow to change, ponderous, and a lot of 
lot of the structure you were seeing there was of that kind. These yeah. long-term steady mm -hmm. uh, eddies and currents sneaking between them mm -hmm. or around them. But there's one moment in that visualization where I couldn't, I was trying to watch everything, couldn't keep it on my head, on the date, where in the, in the Indian Ocean, there's a moment where something happens. It's almost like a phase transition. Mm -hmm. It's a sudden massive shift uh, over a large area. At least I thought that's what I saw. And I was wondering if that was just some artifact of the way the data was being presented, some problem with the system's ability to handle that data, or whether that was a real phenomenon that we see here. Because it suggested to me a kind of large-scale shift in these current patterns of a kind I wouldn't have expected to see. Yeah, now that I'm not sure of. It could be, um, I guess I can see how it could be either, because you could get a shift in the Pacific a phase shift um, coming from the monsoon sh alterations, but I don't, I didn't catch that uh, thing that you're talking about, so I'm, I'm not sure. I would, ex uh, so I think I would almost think that it could be a drop frame too. So if you can call it out while it runs here in the background, I'll, I'll take the next question, okay. and we can bring that through. Bring it on. Bring it back. I was just going to make an observation of the citizen science that there are there are several different organizations that are trying to use uh, citizens to, to gather information um, as opposed to like astronomy groups who look out and try and find something. Mm -hmm. And there's some people that, that yacht organizations, for example, that are trying to gather sonar work. And likewise, hydrographers are looking for this as well, for the telemetry and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I think there is the input side that the citizens can, can, can participate in. Yeah. Yeah, and of course there's there's a GLOBE program, it's known as the GLOBE program too, which is which fosters student engagement in earth sciences work, uh, primarily from an atmospheric standpoint. Um, there's a question over there. Yeah. There's a story, and maybe you know the truth of it. Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, I wonder if that's the El Nino, because you know the surface flow yeah. re reverses during El Nino events. Yeah, that's a, that's actually what happens. There's You get a, a pressure alteration that causes the equatorial current um, off South America to reverse and come um, towards South America instead of away from it. That's why you get the alteration in, 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 that, in that area. So yeah, that kind of patient does that. So there's this story that and maybe you know more of the details of it about somebody inside NASA going to great lengths recently to salvage an old video you know, from the early days of the moon landings, right? Mm -hmm. And you know this person going, you know, spending many hours and salvaging this data set. Yeah. But, it, but it points out this flaw in if you carry these precious videos, you know, and we haven't been back to the moon in God knows how long, and so these are sort of a precious archive that why is it NASA putting more into just you know, maintaining the data? Mm -hmm. And it, it raises the issue of, I, mean, I, I collect a lot of data where I'm pretty sure if I got hit by a truck, about six months later, it would all be in the dumpster. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Yeah. So um, let's see, there's a, bunch, there's a bunch of pieces to the answer of that question. Um, one is precisely this problem that science in the US was seen as a short-term endeavor, you collect some data, you publish a paper, the paper becomes the record, and the data doesn't matter anymore, okay? And NASA had that view a long time. And, and so only since, and, and here I have to blame climate change to a large degree, this idea that we actually have to keep data in, in a usable form for decades is a, relative, is a new thing for, for NASA, and they've They've only really been working towards that since the 1990s sometime. And yeah, they've had to go to some somewhat heroic efforts to dig up old data sets um, and put them into a modern, readable form. Um, and that, you're talking about a, probably the Apollo moon landing video, the one from the Clark's telescope. Um, and yeah, uh, there's all sorts of NASA stuff that might exist somewhere that we don't know about. Um, there's, there's another classic case that the uh, original lunar orbiter spacecraft had much higher image resolution capability than anyone could display with 1967 technology. 
So that data was sent back and recorded on magnetic tape and never shown anything. And fast forward 30 something years, JPL still had the tapes, fortunately, but nothing to play them on. And someone actually had a tape machine sitting in a barn. It of course didn't work anymore, but they got some old timers to restore the thing. Um, and so actually those, that high resolution imagery is, is now being put up on the web because you can view it there in a way no one could in 1967, um, having gone through a fairly heroic effort to salvage it. But I would say that now that this is all happening, the agency's been more, has become better at trying to preserve data sets. Um, and the, drop, the, the question I have, and one of the reasons I, I mentioned this problem of, of the short-term thinking involved in so much of American science, is how, well, how long we will sustain the commitment to keeping these old data sets. Um, and furthermore, what happens for climate particularly, we have this problem of discontinuity of data sets. We use one particular instrument to collect the data sent for 10 years, and then you replace it with some other instrument. Um, how do you know that they're showing exactly the same thing? This is an intercalibration problem in science. And again, this is openly discussed in the scientific literature as a problem, because again, we don't like building the same instrument over and over again. People's, people don't get careers out of that. They get careers out of making new things, and uh, the way we work in this science and engineering. So yeah, that, that's a real problem. Um, and I like, when I'm being positive, I think it's a solved problem, and when I'm being cynical, it's like, well, it's a solved problem until the next day. Okay. Okay, take one more question. Um, yes. oh, okay, one more question. Along the same lines as some of the earlier questions about the NASA and uh, just trying to crowdsource and maybe some of the problems with the solutions to scale up the system which is moving forward. Um if so, I'm not sure how they sustain um that's the the fundamental problem. Um, as I said, we have some outreach efforts that are aimed at trying to get more data in the hands of uh, you know, a larger portion of the citizen. But that's, as I understand it anyway, seen by the agency as an outreach effort, not a fundamental change in the way that they expect science to be done in the future. But that also may change. One of the one of the things that I think that's under certainly understudied by my community is the, the way the, the personal community um, has really transformed the students and such that you can get you get people coming in as undergrads who know more about computing than people who studied computer science in the 1970s at the PhD level. And they're much more capable and can do many more things. And, it's, and I wonder if how, how the community community is taking advantage of that. So I know they are to some degree. But my historical friends are not studying it yet. It's not far enough in the past. <laughs>